It's called uh, Big Problems, Big Government, um, and it is about this history of environmental governance. A, a tradition of thinking, of course, we need very much as the problems are, are dramatically big. And still, 40 years on, it still is the obvious way to start a talk like this with this image of the blue planet that the allegedly the image that led to this cognitive jump that some people like uh, thought was similar to a Copernican revolution that the idea that we saw that our planet was fragile um, and that image has been with us ever since not necessarily as this image although it still is the background of the iPhone uh, if you buy the iPhone 5 or the iPhone 4 for the matter, but it comes with many variations and one of the latest and I suppose very powerful uh, for changes of that image is actually the planetary boundaries image itself. But this blue planet was indeed referred to in that Brundtland Commission report on sustainable development which suggested that at least knowing that fragileness of the planet called for another managerial approach. And this is then the latest manifestation, I suppose, of what is still the same image of the planet now combined with scientific inputs of, of boundaries. It is a very, very powerful tool. Policymakers now f understand in new terms of boundaries the challenge that they're facing and they ask us to tell them the science, tell them the policy, tell them what they need to do and that's to the uh, that's an effect of this image also the graphics I suppose it is indeed a powerful in but in that sense also symbolic or rhetorical tool and one should never forget that it's when you represent something you do something with it it changes the signs listen to the debates we have amongst ourselves about the exact nature of boundaries whether that's possible at all but this is a reminder from Ulrich Beck, he says, uh, who will formulate the symbols that illuminate the structural character of the problem on the one hand, which I think the planetary boundaries concept does so very well, and is also showing the options as to how to act on the other hand. Uh, these tools are the symbols that you need, and I suppose my talk is very much, can we do more on the latter bit of what Ulrich Beck called for? Think of the symbols that show the options on how to act. And that is a call for a different combination of planetary boundary signs with other things that we might have done slightly less. So there are two worries in, in, this, in this talk. The one is the way in which we, of what I call the politics of representation, how you represent the planetary boundaries, eh, because we know it's sometimes very difficult and arg some people argue you can't you know, put them on a global level, it's difficult to say where a tipping point is, how would we know? And the other thing is the worry about the representation of politics. Now, I've decided to keep it short, so that's going to be very difficult because I never keep my talk short, so I only focus on the latter bit, assuming you know the first bit. So the representation of politics, they're actually, uh, uh, listen to how people do that. There are various different ways of representing politics. The most common one is to talk about 40 years in terms of four conferences. So, you, know, you talk about Stockholm, you talk about uh, Rio, you talk about Johannesburg and Rio again. But you can also talk about it in terms of a history of social movements, of people being concerned about people being engaged and it's informative because then you see how that shifts also because the social movements of the 1970s were concerned about basically planetary boundaries but in a different way than we are now. There, it was part of a discourse a, a, that uh, uh, also led to a leader of the Dutch uh, environmental movement driving in his car, interestingly enough, with a rooftop garden. Uh, that was the ultimate of being green to uh, that, uh, uh, the, in, the, in that uh, day and age. There are, as a reminder, obviously parallel tracks. They, you can't reduce one to the other. Limits to growth came out of a corporate effort of the, limit of the uh, Club of Rome combined with a high university computer science in the making. 
Small is Beautiful is a very different sort of track, much more about social concerns, came out at about the same time and appealed to different audiences. Now, environmental historians have pointed out that these two intellectual traditions together produced a force. Not all concern was related to limits to growth, it was also related to the idea that we needed another economy, that the people had been lost in the economy, something that was not present in the limits to growth discourse. So my take is very much to talk about it in terms of evolving discursive structures. How do you talk about it? What are these concepts that people follow? And the discourse is then an ensemble, the, the, and I take very seriously looking into what people say. The phrasings, the green growth, what is green growth? The, the, the notions, the ideas, concepts, categorizations through which meaning is ascribed to social and physical phenomena. That's a discursive take, and I personally think that discourses are more important than institutions. Because you may go to your institute every day, but it makes a hell of a difference whether you work on green growth or on sustainable development or something else. These discourses inform, they're the software that actually makes a computer meaningful. And discourse coalitions suggest then that by sharing a discourse, people become a powerful force, that there are certain ways of talking about the world that can actually change that world. And we as social scientists can help analyze these formations that may actually be built upon a notion indeed like planetary boundaries. Now there is a logic of uh, analyzing that and uh, I contributed to that saying that there is a notion of ecological modernization that was in the 80s, the idea that you didn't need to change the logic of the system, you could make the system work for ecological needs, the win-win approach, uh, that pollution prevented pay, prevention pays, that capitalism could solve itself. It's a wonderful idea, of course, because then you can sort of tinker the system rather than revolutionary transform it. But I suppose the jury is always still out whether that is true or not. Again, it's a social scientific question. But look at how that idea that we can make the system work differently within the system itself, how that is a powerful force. And uh, you can do that by looking at the words that come and the people that present these words. So for instance, Sir Nicholas Stern obviously used a traditional technique of cost-benefit analysis that was used against climate change and he adopted it in a way that it worked for climate change action. Huh? And when it was successful, the biodiversity crowd quickly thought, we need a Nicholas Stern. And actually, isn't it remarkable how well they did in actually casting against somebody with a solid financial background, not necessarily seen as an environmentalist, to apply basically a similar logic using the ecosystem services concept to think about biodiversity in different terms. Now, I would say, discuss analytically, it changes what biodiversity politics then means. You do it in a different way if you want to value it in the particular logic of ecosystem services. And sometimes I think in the policy world it's adopted very uncritically, as if this is always going to be to the, to the good, but perhaps not. Because if you value something, some things become really valuable and other things are less valuable. And if it's all open for a market and pe some people would pay the high price, then they can destroy nature. Is that, is that the sort of biodiversity policy you want? Or you want it to be ethical to say, I think thou should not destroy nature. So applying an economic logic pushes out other arguments potentially. That's, that's a, a take on, on discourses. Now, behind words is a world of institutions. And we had a word, a word of climate which was powerful. And I suppose we sort of experience how the whole institutional world that was set up behind the, uh, behind the word climate now suddenly become so far less powerful. Huh? The entry point of climate was invest, we invested in it with IPCC, with UNFCCC, but somehow these institutions lost steam. 
and we never abolish them, basically the game changes to another place. And again, we of course as scientists contributed very much to that, but you see the institutional logic run out of steam and we look for new words that suddenly pop up and now for instance green growth is one of those words where there's a whole new institutional effort very quickly. Now two pieces this uh, in the lead up to Rio I suppose were, were really crucial in saying how science spoke to power and it was the state of the planet declaration and the, uh, the essay of uh, navigating the Anthropocene. Now my concern about these statements was that they spoke in a very firm language to politics. But I was uncertain whether that their understanding of politics, their representation of the political, is appropriate to this day and age. Because it suggested that there was in Rio going to be a meeting of what I call the cockpit. That the world system has a cockpit of the collaboration of nations in the United Nations, the 193 countries sharing a conference and then coming to a decision. So science was summarizing its, its findings in these statements and delivering it to the political and that would then make a decision. But we found out there is no cockpit. We should have known better. There is no place where we can steer the world as if it is a spaceship. Let's move a bit more to the right. It's a myriad of decisions that we make that informs change. Although politicians will always be the last to tell you because they need to suggest that they are in charge. That indeed these places are there of power and that there is indeed a cockpit. Well, obviously there is a cockpit, but let's say we're quarreling a lot in that cockpit. There is a, what I call a fallacy of the decisive effect. So the idea that there is a particular moment where you, then a decision is made. So if you do interviews with politicians, you often hear them and you ask them how did, you know, what was the evolution of the events and say, well, I very well remember this particular meeting, then we decided. But if you look at the documents, mostly, you find that that's not true. There is a notion of the willingness of making firm decisions, whereas in, f in actual fact there are many different places where little decisions are taken and politics often comes behind these decisions, codifies, as it were, much more than initiate. But still our scientific rhetoric is one where we say that it is 5 to 12. But the unfortunate news is that we've been saying it's 5 to 12 for 40 years. Is that it are, should we reconsider the way in which we organize our knowledge so that we don't comply, conform to that format that politics will ultimately act if we only point out how near we are to the planetary boundaries? And if we want to do that, how could we do that? Now here's a reason to do this because just assume that politics would change, then it would say, well, it's a big problem, so we need big government. It might actually, you hear that discourse a bit, is democracy able to solve the problems of our day and age? Should we perhaps, you know, become a bit more, a bit less democratic in face of the big problems out there? But me as a social scientist, a critical social scientist, I would be very worried about that. And I think ultimately my love is much more with democracy than with anything else. And also because we know that this politics has such a bad track record. We have failed with our big schemes of the world, both in town planning with Le Corbusier, but as James Scott also analyzes, also with the big reform projects in the third world. These big decisions that are made are also vulnerable because they don't learn. They, they, they want to implement rather than organize. In the, city, in the city planning we've seen how these illusions of a fantastic move, of a dream for everybody living in beautiful buildings is actually uh, dynamited after winning an architectural prize uh, in the Prit Ego building in St. Louis. And this is a variation, you see this very much the same townscape in Bangalore, where 
it was meant to help people out of poverty, but the system that they in installed in this term, the water system, was so malfunctioning that the only solution they could take was have these 12 year old kids change the little improvised pipes from, so that one family after the next would have a little drop of water. Informal infrastructure is the only sustainable infrastructure, said the anthropologist that provided these pictures to me. So here is Le Corbusier thinking big and changing the scheme. And here was his correction, Jane Jacobs, who said actually that big scheme for New York is not the future. It is actually knowing how neighborhoods work. And that logic is actually very interestingly very much with us now. We have historically seen the, the, the sensibility of Jane Jacobs with her understanding of the city and face-to-face -face context as being the superior in terms of understanding how a city can improve itself to the ground scheme of Robert Jacobs. So my call is let's also think beyond the political if we want to be successful. Realize that political success requires social roots, that politicians are often far more inclined to be revolutionary if they know it's actually not so revolutionary, that there is a guarantee that people actually like these things. So look out in the cities what people do, what their concerns are, in order to be able to create a sort of coalition that helps the politicians. But if you put so much emphasis on society, is that then going to deliver the solutions in time? Well, in a study that uh, Marcel and others and uh, Tom did uh, for, for PBL, uh, the roads from Rio, we, we say, well, we can still technically achieve these goals that we need to achieve by 2050. But, you know, time is running out, it's becoming very difficult. And is that then the moment at which to say, well, politics should not be dominated from the center? Well, I, I use this image of a desert because it is the reality of the third world at the moment that in a country like India, on the one hand, we see many initiatives in terms of renewables, but at the same time, an uh, urban corridor is erected in a desert of 10 mega cities with no ecological underpinning at all. Eh? So on the one hand, we see central governments coming up with big, big uh, infrastructures that do not relate at all to their ecological effort as well. So it's not as if centralized decision making is necessarily going to solve it. I think we can help these politicians. We can also help as academics this process of being, of helping a beautiful world of 2050. But then we need to be bold. We need a, a bold vision that is actually attractive and that may inform actually such a discourse coalition. Now here is a colleague of mine from the planning field, Jim Throckmorton. He says, after analyzing the nitty gritty of electricity generation planning in Chicago, I come to the conclusion that planning is persuasive storytelling about the future. He analyzed all the minutes, but he said, ultimately it was that moment that there was a group of people that had a vision where to go to, that made all these bureaucracies, all these enterprises work and do their little thing. The power of stories is not to be underestimated. And I suppose if you then look for these stories, what are the stories that may potentially be so powerful? I suppose there is a story that can be constructed, is being constructed, of the greening of capitalism, ecological modernization revisited. Jeremy Rifkin with the Third Industrial Revolution, the OECD, World Bank, UNEP, they all tell little snippets of it, be it unfortunately in a language that's not really that appealing. Now, we may not always agree with these two guys, <laughs> but this phrase is very nice, I think. Martin Luther King did not say, I have a nightmare. <laughs> he said, I have a dream, and he mobilized a whole constituency and he changed American society. So what if we so well in these prophecies of doom? What could be our dream? What could be 
the way in which our science that knows so much about what can go wrong can be combined with things that can be positive and that will actually inspire people. Let's try and create that, that vision, that vision thing that is indeed about that fantastic idea of a renewable society that has endless supply of energy. I mean, these are sort of sentences that help, right? They are clean, they have no emissions. That can actually cater for people that have development needs, not only for California. And I think also an underexplored territory is that of infrastructure. Just think of how much of our infrastructure is 20th century based. Can we come up with a set of 21st century infrastructure needs? I mean, we know a bit the language, it's the wrong language, but we can reframe that. We can talk about smart grids, we can talk about how a grid can sort of unlock geothermal capacities. And to give you a sense of how a story can actually help, in the Netherlands we had a big wind farm in the north and the worry was that it would be blowing very fierce at night and nobody would want the electricity. So what they did, they pulled a cable 400 million euros worth to Sweden actually to pump up uh, your uh, hydroelectric uh, lakes uh, overnight so that you could let the, the water run down uh, over uh, in the morning. And they estimated it would take eight years to repay. After three years, they decided to have a second cable in Norway. Sorry, I don't know what, where these lakes are. Somewhere up here. <laughs> <laughs> now, that sounds a lot of money, but here it, it was repaid. And the funny thing was that the, the initially nobody wanted to do that calculation. They underestimated the innovation capacity. So there is an alternative world that can be and these stories of success are obviously what you want to share. So here is the conceptual scheme then, I think, that, that gives us a sense of a research program. We, we like to tell the story in terms of technology, gadgets. Huh? But it's actually not the gadgets which are going to be the game changer. It's, it's the people, it's the value change the el element, the entrepreneurialism, that gets oriented by institutional rules that make sure that those who change profit and that those who actually are laggards uh, have a price to pay. That sort of interplay is something which I call the energetic society, but that actually may indeed produce a different understanding of the sort of policies that we need, because we are not so good as governments to have open-ended policy measures, because we always want to know what comes out in the end. And my argument is, our society is able to learn, but it suggests much more openness, much more ex, ex durant evaluation, rather than being able to predict in advance. And who are then these new agents of change? What is in such a new discourse coalition an important group? I'm intrigued by how consultants, who are of course producers of discourse, how they now jump on, on this green issue, eh? talking about, to the business community about the risks, the, and the, the risk of the unexpected, I mean, about inaction, physical, competitive, regulatory, reputational, litigation, social risks. These reports, after which they of course are kindly offering to sell a product of green accountancy, these sort of reports may indeed have an effect before politics changes the game. It's not politics that changes the game, it's these sort of entrepreneurs that change the game. Or McKinsey pointing out how sustainability might be the next big global business opportunity. Yeah? Using, vaguely I suppose, Rifkin's suggestion of the third industrial revolution. Or look at cities who are not forced to come active in the climate sphere, but do act. Again, it's not the national government that acts, but it is cities that then become an association. And we might actually try and come up with assessment to what extent is such an association of cities as powerful as nation states. And interestingly, if you do these calculations, you get a long way. In terms of CO2 emissions, they are often urban related. And if you look at the group that now collaborates in, in something like the, the, the C40 uh, 
you see that that indeed is about 8% or something of the global population. That's not nothing. But then to, to conclude, the story ultimately is that it's not meaningful to me to say there are planetary boundaries and the social science should be about how do we respect them. There is a politics after the planetary boundaries in which this are, is a new call on science, our science, where it is about these coalitions that can produce different worlds that all are possible in the light of acting upon planetary boundaries. It's not one solution for all, it's actually a coalition that needs to be glued and that may actually be a very promising way to still move forward in a world where the cockpit is still quarreling. Thanks for your attention.